Hello everyone and welcome to the MTAP for the first semester in Clinical Parasitology. So in this video, we will be discussing the vast world of the protozoans. And the first phylum associated with the protozoan is your phylum Sarcomastigaphora. So your subkingdom protozoa is divided into three clinically important phylums. We have your phylum Sarcomastigaphora, phylum Ciliophora, and the phylum Apicomplexa. In this video, we will be discussing the first class under your phylum Sarcomastigaphora, and that would be the class Lobosea or what we call the Amoebas. Here are some general characteristics of your protozoans, specifically your amoebas. So your amoebas are unicellular animal-like protists that are considered to be eukaryotic, which means that these particular parasites are, are contain nucleus and other organelles. Also, some of the stages of these parasites require a wet environment for feeding and navigating the host. So this is for locomotion, osmoregulation, and reproduction of the parasites. The infective stage of your amoebas would be the cis. This is the resistant form of the parasite. And the vegetative state, so when we say vegetative, which means this is the feeding stage of the parasites, which is your trapezoid. Here are the other general characteristics that we need to take note for the class Lobosea or the amoebas. So all amoebas have cis stage except for Entamoeba gingivalis. So this only has the trapezoid as their morphological forms. All inhabit the large intestine except for Entamoeba gingivalis. So from the species name gingivalis, this is only present in the mouth of the infected host. All are commensals, so when we say commensals, these are non-phatogenic, except for Entamoeba histolytica. So this is the only phatogenic intestinal amoeba. And other names for these types of amoebas, we have your Entamoeba hartmani. This is the small race amoeba. Entamoeba coli, the largest amoeba, which contains 1 to 8 nucleus in their cis forms and endolimax nana as the smallest intestinal amoeba. In terms of the hematogranules or special organs for locomotion, your amoeba uses your pseudopods as their organelle or motility organelle, while your flagellates for flagella, your cilia for the ciliates, and for the apicomplexans, there are no definite locomotory organ. So just like we have discussed a while ago, your amoebas have two morphological stages. So we have your trapezoid, which is the motile with your pseudopods, just like here on this picture. These are also the feeding stage and vegetative stage of the parasite. So in terms of the specimen, stool specimen that are liquid and diarrheic are the best specimen for the recovery of the trapezoids. But please be mindful that the trapezoids are very delicate. So the longer the stool stands at room temperature, the lower the chance of these parasites uh, be recovered. So they usually disintegrate about two hours uh, in prolonged standing. Next one, we have your cyst. So your cyst is a non-motile stage of the parasite. This is also the non-feeding, but the infective stage of the parasite. So in terms of the stool specimen, well-formed stool are more common to harbor the cyst stage of the parasites. So let's start first with the intestinal amoeba starting with Entamoeba histolytica. So this is the only pathogenic amoeba among all your intestinal parasites. So the focus of the lecture will be on to your Entamoeba histolytica. So your Entamoeba histolytica, also known as your Losch amoeba, comes from the uh, discoverer, Feeder Losch. This is the only pathogenic intestinal amoeba. So this causes amoebiasis, which we'll be discussing later on. And this contributes to the 10% of cases, parasitic cases, worldwide. So this is the third leading cause of parasitic deaths after malaria and schistosomiasis. So in the U.S., the incident rate is usually 5%. 
In terms of the morphology for the cis form of your entamoeba histolytica, these are spherical in shape and usually contains 1 to 4 nucleus, just like here on this picture. So the higher the number of nucleus present in the cis, the mature the cis is. In terms of the peripheral chromatin of the nucleus, so as you can see, the peripheral chromatin is a fine and uniform, just like here on this picture. The cariosome or the small dot at the center of the nucleus is small and central. The cytoplasm is finely granular and the cytoplasmic inclusions is usually include or usually includes your chromatoid bar so your chromatoid bars is very unique to the cis so walang ganyan sa trophozoid sa cis lang meron nito and in terms for in terms of entamoeba histolytica their chromatoidal bars are coffin rod sig uh, cigar or sausage shape so here is a sample picture of your entamoeba histolytica cis so for the trophozoite, this has lesser nucleus. So as you can see, for entamoeba histolytica, it only contains one nucleus present on their cytoplasm. In terms of their cariosome, kindly take note, since uh, cis forms are small and central, this is also the same as in your trophozoite. So this is described as the bull's eye appearance. For the cytoplasm, similar to cis forms, these are finely granular with clean looking appearance no? or ground glass appearance. Also take note of the hallmark or the diagnostic um, inclusion bodies of your trophozoite and that would be the RBCs present. So only entamoeba histolytica has that inclusion bodies, your red blood cells. Since this is the motile morphological stage, the motility of this parasite or stage is progressive, unidirectional. So one direction or in other sources, they say that this is explosive motility. So here are the sample pictures of your trophozoite for entamoeba histolytica. So the cariosome is very uh, evident, central or bullseye. So for the life cycle of most of your amoebas, this is initiated by the accidental ingestion of the infective stage, the cyst. So the cyst will travel to the small intestine where excistation and nuclear division happens. So for the nuclear division, this is a process where a single nucleus divides into two identical copies. For amoebas, as much as eight copies of nucleus is created. So this nucleus represent one single undeveloped trophozoid. So this also in the same habitat, your small intestine, this nucleus will develop into trophozoid and existation happens. This is where the process of a cyst becoming or rupturing to release this particular trophozoid. So after developing from a single cyst to multiple copies of your trophozoites, your trophozoites will migrate from the small intestine to your large intestines where encystation and binary fission happens. So in binary fission, this is the reproduction by separation of the bodies into two new bodies, just like here on this picture. So in order for the trophozoite to reproduce, they need to undergo this type of fission, your binary fission, where one single trophozoite can create two exactly the same copies of their um, morphological form. This is also the site, your large intestine, where encystation happens. So in order for the parasite to continue its life cycle to the another host, this trophozoite will develop or will take the process of encystation so from a single trophozoite becoming a cis form again and this will be passed down in the stool to infect another host here are again the infective and diagnostic stages for the amoebas so for extraintestinal kindly take note trophozoite are usually the present morphological forms so for the pathology of your amoeba, this is called your amoebiasis. And there are several diseases that are associated with this parasite. 
The first one in, is the intestinal infection. So this is what we call your amoebic dysentery. So based on the word it's or the name itself, this is the diarrhea or a bloody mucoid diarrhea that is caused by your amoeba. So there are several gastrointestinal problems that uh, might be felt by the patient, example of which is your abdominal pain, cramping, weight loss, and so on and so forth. Also take note of the presence of your flesh-shaped ulcer, usually seen at the chronic stage of the patient or the disease. For chronic, there are already amoebic ulcer, just like here on this picture. There is our ulceration surrounding your colon and secondary bacterial peritonitis. So since this particular uh, area of the intestine is already ulcerated or has uh, necrotic tissues, bacterial infection may also result in these kinds of um, parasitic disease. Next one is your extraintestinal amoebiasis, and the first one is your liver. So your antamoeba histolytica tropozoid may also travel from your intestine to your liver, causing amoebic hepatitis or amoebic liver abscess. This is the most serious uh, infection among all your amoeba infection, which is usually involve a abscess which has an anchovy sauce-like appearance. Next is for the brain. So this can also travel the brain causing severe uh, secondary amoebic encephalitis. The skin as well and also the lungs which also produces anchovy sauce like sputum. So although very general, the charcot laden crystals may also be present on stool samples of patients with increased eosinophil in their blood. Normally, these charcot laden crystals appear as pyramidal crystals just like here on this picture which stains red on trichome staining. So these are disintegration or fragments of eosinophils. For the diagnosis of entamoeba, especially your entamoeba histolytica, the specimen of choice is stool. So normally we can uh, check the eggs of this parasite and also liver aspirate may be acquired, especially at cases with amoebic liver abscess. So the method to be used here is your concentration techniques. So this is the gold standard for amoeba identification. So these are used only for light infections and not recommended for protozoan tropozoites. That's why it's very important to uh, extract or to acquire eggs in the stool sample of the patient. Uh, in the principle of concentration technique, parasites should have a lesser specific gravity than the reagent so that it will float on top of the solution. So examples of your concentration technique would be the zinc sulfate flotation. This is the most recommended one, but we can also use the brine flotation technique and the sheeters sugar flotation. So again, the zinc sulfate flotation method is the most recommended and most preferred method for the recovery of amoebic cyst. So this uses 33% zinc sulfate solution and the ideal specific gravity should fall, uh, should fall under 1.18 for a fresh specimen to 1.20 for preserved specimens. So again, this is not useful for the recovery of tropozoites because of the presence of your zinc sulfate solution. So this destroy or distorts the uh, appearance of your tropozoites. So only cysts, specifically your protozoan cysts and helminth eggs may be used on this particular procedure. So again, the principle behind this is that the zinc sulfate solution contains higher specific gravity than the eggs. So the eggs float on top of the solution. Although uncommon, we can also use culture media to grow these types of parasites, specifically your amoeba. So this is basically increasing the yield of your trophozoite, which are in normal conditions, uh, becomes disintegrated in other procedures. So in culture media, we can use to increase the viability of these parasites, specifically their tropozoites. We can also use the immunofluorescence and PCR, especially if we want to differentiate the pathogenic amoeba to non-pathogenic amoeba. So later on, we'll be discussing the non-pathogenic ones. We can also stain or increase the nuclear details of several morphological stages of our amoeba. So for cysts, we can use the Lugos iodine. 
for the trapezoid, the quincelles methylene blue is the most recommended one. So one of the hallmarks, again, of your entamoeba histolytica is the presence of the RBC, usually at the cytoplasm of trapezoids. But there is one specific amoeba that is very similar to entamoeba histolytica, and that would be your entamoeba dispar. So this is a non-phatogenic amoeba that is morphologically identical to entamoeba histolytica. So some laboratory uh, reports this as both entamoeba histolytica slash entamoeba dispar if the presence of a trophozoite or cyst do not have RBCs. Next one is entamoeba muskovsky. So this is a non-phatogenic amoeba as well. And this is also similarly identical to entamoeba histolytica. So this is formerly known as Laredo strain. And in order for us to differentiate the entamoeba histolytica from other similar organisms, especially the non-phatogenic amoeba, we can use PCR, RFLP, and monoclonal antibodies to differentiate these types of species. So here is the summary for all the non-phatogenic amoeba in terms of the morphology of their cyst forms. So for entamoeba hartmanni, the most important one here is the presence of the bar-like or rice grain shaped chromatoidal bars. While for entamoeba coli, it contains the numerus or the highest nucleus in a cyst form at around 1 to 8. Also take note of the splinter-like or broomstick appearance for their chromatoidal bars. For Entamoeba gingivalis, this is the amoeba with no cyst stage, just like we have discussed a while ago. For Endolimax nana, this is the cross-eyed cyst and it contains a blood-like caryosome. For the Iodamoeba butchli, the most important one here is the presence of a glycogen mass. So this takes up the iodine once we uh, subjected the cyst into iodine preparation. So it stains dark brown under the microscope. That's why it's called iodamoeba from the word iodine and amoeba. The next one is the morphology in terms of their trapezoid. So also take note since trapezoid is the motile one, motility may also be used to differentiate these types of non-pathogenic amoeba. Such as for entamoeba hartmanni, this is the non-progressive one. Also for coli, which is non-progressive and sluggish. For gingivalis, moderately active. For endolimax nana, it is sluggish, non-progressive. As well as for iodamoeba, butchli. In terms of the appearance, for entamoeba hartmanni, it has a small caryosome. While for entamoeba coli, it has a large caryosome with a dirty-looking cytoplasm. For entamoeba gingivalis, take note of the inclusion bodies present inside their trapezoid, and that would be the epithelial cells present in the mouth area and white blood cells as well. So usually for entamoeba gingivalis, this is associated with bacterial infection in the mouth. So people with unhygienic uh, mouth with a lower uh, mouth hygiene are susceptible to these types of parasites. For endolimax nana, the presence of a blood-like caryosome, just like in the cyst form, is also important. For iodamoeba butchli, it contains a refractive or refractile achromatic granules. So now we move on to the opportunistic amoebas, and that would be the acanthamoeba species and nigderia fowleri. So for the general characteristics of your amoeba, these are considered free-living. So that means these are usually seen naturally in soil and water. This is acquired or accidentally acquired by man by swimming or diving in stagnant, warm, and still water. Normally, this is acquired through nasal aspiration of water infected with free-living amoeba. So the parasite enters the nasal mucosa and penetrates the cribiform plate and multiplies in the gray matter of our brain. So this disease is characterized by purulent CSF with increased WBC, red blood cell, plus the appearance of the amoebic trapezoids. So again, this includes your Negleria and Acanthamoeba species. 
So let's differentiate the morphology of the two opportunistic amoeba in terms of their cis and trapezoid. So let's start first with Nagleria fowleri. So the cis forms of this parasite contains a round with smooth heavy walled cis, just like here on this picture. So the karyosome is central with no peripheral chromatin and the cytoplasm is finely granular, just like here on this picture. It also has a thick walled cis wall. For the trapezoid of Nigleria fowleri, it contains two forms. We have the limax form and the amoebo flagellate form. So for the limax form, this is the slug-like blunt pseudopod. So this is the amoeboid form or a more amoeba-like amoeba form between the two. So this is the picture. So as you can see, pseudopods are present on this form, your limax form. So this is also the same with the cis form, no peripheral chromatin with a large karyosome. Next, the amoeba flagellate or the flagellate form. So this means that it contains not pseudopods but rather a flagella. So these are pear-shaped with a jerky spinning motility. Just like here on this picture. So it contains a double flagella plus a central karyosome with no peripheral chromatin. And lastly, for Acanthamoeba castellani, this is also double, uh, this is doubled walled, just like your cis, uh, cis form of Nagleria fowleri, but it has a wrinkled cis, just like here on this picture. So the uh, sol wall, okay, is uh, double, so we have one and we have two much like a, fr a fried egg or a sunny side up appearance. For the trapezoid of Acanthamoeba, take note of the spiny hyaline extensions. So this is what we call the acanthopods. That's why it's so called Acanthamoeba because of the presence of these structures. So here is the appearance of your acanthopodia or acanthopods. So these are pseudopods that are pointy or attenuated. For the motility, this is sluggish with polydirectional uh, in, term, in terms of their motility. In the life cycle of your opportunistic amoeba, such as your Negleria and Acanthamoeba, these two are considered free-living. So that means these types of free-living organisms do not require hosts to develop their species. So these are naturally occurring parasites seen in soil and water. So for the infective and diagnostic stage, trapezoid is the morphological form present on these stages. The mode of transmission for this parasite is through swimming or diving in stagnant, warm, and still water. This is done or transmitted through the olfactory neuroepithelium by nasal aspiration of water. So let's talk about the pathology behind the two opportunistic amoeba. So the first one is Nagleria fowleri, and this causes PAM, or what we call your primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So this is caused by the amoeboid trapezoid, which is your infective stage for Nagleria fowleri, invades the brain and causes rapid tissue destruction. So this causes a fever, headache, sore throat, and in chronic cases, meningitis or the inflammation of your brain meninges. Other symptoms may also include smell and taste alteration, block nose, and the Koenig signs. So just like here on this picture, this is the inability of the legs to strengthen when the legs or hip is flexed at 90 degree angle. In untreated patient, that usually occur at 1 to 2 weeks after being infected with the parasite. So for Acanthamoeba castellani, this causes gay or what we call the granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. So this is similar to a PAM but the difference is there is the presence of granulomatous lesion. So again, just like we have discussed, your granulomatous or granuloma formation is a mixture of the trapezoid but also the white blood cells and other uh, killer cells present on the area. So this causes pressure around the brain causing different types of neurological deficits. 
So, this causes headaches, seizures, stiff neck, nausea, and vomiting. Another disease that is associated with Acanthamoeba castellani is what we call Acanthamoeba keratitis. So, this is the infection of the cornea of the eye causing perforation within the area. So, this is caused by cysts but mostly trophozoite. So, this causes severe ocular pain and vision problems to the infected host. And sometimes, the improper use of contact lenses may be one of the mode of transmission for this particular disease. In the diagnosis of Nigeria Fowleri, the specimen of choice is CSF or brain tissue. So, to highlight the trophozoite present on the sample, we can use acridine orange as their stains. For culture, uh, we can use non-nutrient agar plates seeded with gram-negative bacilli such as your E. coli. So this serves as the food for the trophozoite. So basically, this is done by adding one drop of sample into a non-nutrient agar plate with E. coli. And if the sample or the CSF sample contains trophozoite or infected with the Gleria fowleri, this trophozoite will eventually develop and chase out the E. coli present on the nutrient agar. Okay, this is uh, for, since these trophozoites are the vegetative stage or the feeding stage, this trailing effect will be evident on the culture medium. So for the diagnosis of Acanthamoeba castellani, CSF is still the specimen of choice, but we can use alternatively your brain tissue samples and in cases of Acanthamoeba keratitis, corneal scrapings are more recommended. For the stain, to highlight the morphology of your trophozoites, we can use the calculophor white stain. For the culture, just like in what we have discussed in Negleria fowleri, we can use your PYGC medium, a non-nutrient agar medium that is seeded with E. coli. So here we observe the trailing effect if there is the presence of trophozoite in the CSF sample. But the most important one here is your indirect immunofluorescence assay. This is the technique or the method of choice for the detection of the two opportunistic amoeba, your negleria and acanthamoeba. So this is a two-step serological technique for the detection of circulating antibodies in a CSF sample. So the unlabeled first primary antibody, just like here on this picture, specifically binds to the target molecule and the second antibody which carries the fluoropore recognizes the primary antibody and binds into it. So that ends our discussion for the amoebas. Thank you and good day.